Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, for the first time since 1973, the military is facing one of the most worst recruiting environment since the creation of the all-voluntary force. Military services, especially the Army, are missing recruitment targets at an alarming rate that may jeopardize, according to some, even perhaps our national security. We're joining me in the conversation is Colonel Jamie Cogbill, Professor of Military Science and Department Head as leader of Virginia Tech and Radford Army ROTC. And thank you so much for joining the conversation. Oh, my pleasure, Bob. It's great to be here and chat with a fellow Hokie. Amen, <laughs> amen to that. Well, you know, I have to say that this is somewhat deja vu from the standpoint that between 1980 and 84, I was with the uh, recruiting command and, and the Army was facing some recruitment challenges during that time, somewhat similar to hear, and I got to work on the development of the BRUB advertising campaign, and so it really caught my interest of my goodness, both in terms of the service aspect, but also in terms of some of the various issues related to recruiting. Uh, as of late spring, um, the Army had only recruited 68 percent um, of its target. The Navy was 8 percent short. It appears that the Air Force and Marines and Space Force were were projected to meet their particular uh, target. But by 2023, total forces may be down somewhere, they're saying between 30 and 40,000. Uh, I was shocked in some of the testimony on Capitol Hill that the population of 17 to 24 year olds, which is the target population, if who can meet the physical and mental standards of that target group is just 23%. What does that mean in terms of the physical standards and mental standards? All right. Well, first of all, Bob, let me say thank you for your work on the Be All You Can Be campaign. I think okay. most soldiers look back on that campaign fondly. Um, but uh, great question. Uh, as you said, um, right now it looks like only 23% of the, the eligible population out there is meeting the physical mental standards. That's down from 29% uh, um, just a, a few years ago. Um, and so the, some of those things uh, include uh, obesity. Um, so just kind of, you know, the, the, how, how much they weigh and, uh, you know, their body fat content. Um, uh, some of it for mental or some of the medical uh, issues um, could be, you know, some past medications they've been on. Uh, a big thing is behavioral medications uh, that uh, are more and more common these days among our youth. Um, and then I'll just, tag on to that too uh, from what I understand the um, part of the problem is from a uh, recent digitization of all the medical records where there's basically a, a much better visibility on medical records than there used to be and so whereas maybe in the past someone could have just maybe not talked about that to their recruiter what was in their medical records now it's kind of you know that the, there's sort of you can see all and so if there was ever any um, you know behavioral health medication um, prescribed in the past that will come out in the scrub um, but then the last thing is the uh, the mental aptitude um, and uh, I've got an interesting statistic on that uh, as you may be aware um, in order to enter the military or the army you have to take a test called the ASVAB um, and uh, don't, don't quote me on what that stands for, but uh, it's something vocational aptitude battery, armed services vocational aptitude battery. Okay, that's what it is. Um, and uh, pre-COVID, um, about seven out of 10 out of the eligible population could pass that test. Post-COVID, they're finding only three out of 10 can pass that test. And so, um, as you can maybe presume, I think that there's some concern that maybe there are you know, the online virtual learning that occurred during, you know, COVID may have had a bit of a negative impact wow. on, on uh, Americans' ability to pass, the, pass that test, so. And I guess being that the economy, of course we get mixed messages on that, um, but the fact of the matter is unemployment is only 3.6%. I would imagine that the overall lower um, unemployment rate also has to be a factor in terms of the economy. So. That's a huge factor. Um, it, it always seems historically when, when the economy is doing, or at least when, when employment is, uh, is, is um, high and unemployment is low, then uh, it, it becomes a more difficult recruiting environment. Um, yeah. You know, it used to be one of the things back in the 80s, and again, I'm dating myself, and, 
and things certainly uh, changed a great deal. But it seems like that there was always, if you served, there was a relation that served. Either your grandfather, your father, there was an uncle, there was a, a family relation. And yet I was surprised to see that among that target group, 17 to 24, 13 percent had parents who had served in the military, and that was down from 40 percent just in 1995. And so even that connection, you kind of lose that, not understanding what military service is and what it um, is composed of. That's absolutely right. They um, have referred to, I've heard it referred to as a family business. <laughs> you know, um, the military has kind of become that way. Um, uh, you know, my father served in the Army and my, both my grandfathers were in the Army. Um, and, you know, when I have classes of cadets or, you know, in the past and other units when I've asked, you know, how many of you have, uh, you know, parents or close family members who serve, you know, I would uh, probably usually two thirds, three quarters of the, the class will raise their hand. Um, and that, you know, that thing about it being a family business is, is kind of nice, but it's also a bit of a concern because I think it only adds to the potential civil military divide, you know, and when you have less than 1% of the population now who is actually currently serving, um, uh, then, you know, you start to create this, you know, us and them or, or just people just don't know or have any connection to military service. So it's harder to bring them into that and make them understand all the great things about uh, military service. Well, um, you know, one of the things, um, there's certainly not only an eligible pool that's shrinking, but you know, the demographics, I mean, the, the key demographics, there's just not as many millennials as baby boomers and mm. also in terms of, of the um, Z generation. This also seems to be interesting, um, even prior to COVID, but we're seeing it kind of a lifestyle issues. I mean, there's concern about um, work itself and what does that mean? I want to have work-life balance. And in the military, of course, you may have more frequent moves. It impacts the family. Um, and so some of those concerns um, are raised. The notion that we used to work to live versus live to work, that kind of tension now. And so that's also kind of a lifestyle factor that's becoming um, uh, an issue. Right, yeah, I, you're probably right about that. And um, I think the Army recognizes that and they, they realize they are in a war for talent, I think is the, the phrase they've used. Um, and uh, so they are looking at ways to make um, a career in the Army more attractive. Um, there is a uh, organization up at the headquarters of the Army called the Army Talent Management Task Force um, where they are focusing on ways to um, really uh, capitalize on soldiers' strengths and uh, let them follow, you know, follow what they really want to do. Um, with this current recruiting crisis, uh, they are looking at offering uh, soldiers their uh, assignment of choice, their post of choice, so they can choose um, pretty much any post. Uh, you know, if they agree to enlist, they can go to Hawaii, which is one of the best places <laughs> to go in the Army, or Germany, or, you know, um, so some other great places that they have the choice, and that's one of the things they're offering to, to get more people to join in. Some of the other incentives they have are, you know, up to a $50,000 signing bo bonus, or a uh, up to a $35,000 uh, quick ship bonus. So if you're willing to, to you know, move out um, 45 days after signing your name on the dotted line, then you can get another $35,000. So. So that, that's the money side of it, but um, I think that there's a, the Army has a current campaign that they're doing, sort of focused on officers right now, but it's called the Decide to Lead campaign, and just really talking about um, how if you choose a career, as an, especially as an officer in the United States military, you can really kind of choose your own path um, and, and uh, get yourself to your ultimate goal, whatever that may be, through things like uh, all the educational incentives, you know, the post 9-11 GI Bill or tuition assistance, um, and also just that having that chance to, to lead, to, dis to choose to decide to lead, um, and, uh, and how that will benefit you in any career path that you go down the road. There were several elements of a survey, again, coming out in congressional testimony, like of the target, only 9% of those would kind of consider, mm -hmm. even inclined to perhaps um, join. 57% uh, expressed concerns about thinking that service might somehow lead to emotional or even physical kinds of, 
of issues or problems and certainly not understanding when they would think about, well, what do you do, uh, March, and just, uh, you know, not understanding what it means to be in terms of the military, especially from a career perspective. And those are some of the things that are uh, interesting. Uh, one of the things that has been written about, a little bit delicate, and, and I'm going to, this is coming more from me, and I'm not necessarily asking you to overly respond, but Wow, there seems to be in some criticizing saying the nature and culture of the of the military is changing and they are becoming woke. That some of the Chairman Milley's comments on race, white privilege, critical race theory, um, having to adjust to the uh, transgender as uh, uh, an issue. Um, and that politicization just seems to be almost into the military, whereas I haven't really seen that kind of um, political um, incorporation in earlier years. And it seems like that that's become kind of a focus now, that that, that polarization and politicalization within the, in the for service. Right. Uh, I, I would probably comment on that a couple ways. One is I, I feel like at least as long as I've been in the Army, um, the Army's always been focused on being a values-based organization. Um, you know, we really want to lead with our values, um, and uh, you know, the Army values used to be something you would wear on a little tag on your dog, you know, your, your dog with your dog tags that you know, have the Army values there. But uh, it's more than just a tag; it's more about who we are and, and trying to be the best um, people we can be. Um, so that's one aspect of it. But the other thing, um, in terms of uh, you know, looking at, at who we let into the Army and that sort of thing, and uh, being accepting of that. I think to a pretty good extent, the Army's always been a little bit in the vanguard when it comes to some of those social issues, you know. Um, some would argue it, it took too long, but others would say, you know, really in terms of gaining broad-based cultural uh, acceptance of things like, you know, desegregation or um, acceptance of, of homosexuals and things like that uh, came after those, you know, the, the Army was integrated. Um, and I think what's interesting, if you go back and think about, uh, you know, before we had Don't Ask, Don't Tell, but then when, you know, um, uh, homosexual, homosexuals were allowed to serve openly, you know, there was a lot of pushback before that happened, even from people in the military. But then once the change happened and we were integrated, it was kind of like, I, you know, it's kind of a dumb word, but a big nothing burger, you know, it was like, it, it, Everybody was perfectly fine with it, you know. It, it you know, once it got past what weather was going to happen, once it happened, um, nobody had any issue with it. And so I think it's, I think it'll be the same with some of these other uh, social issues. And, and we're just trying to, um, and I don't say we, but you know, the way I personally think about it is, um, just just trying to keep keep track with with society and and uh, um, and keeping our values at the forefront. You know, one of the things that um, um, surprises me the most and, 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 and breaks my heart is seeing the generational divide as, as it relates to uh, being proud to be an American. Mm. Saw some recent statistics that if you look extremely proud of all of adults in terms of America, only 38% said they were very proud to be an American. Generation Z uh, was 51%, millennials at 62%. Baby boomers like me, um, uh, 85%. Mm. And when you then look at, are there party differences? Are, are there ideological differences? And as you can imagine, uh, um, yes, progressives only 34%, really proud to be an American. Traditional conservatives, 96%. Moderates at 87%. And the thing about being in the service, it's not just a job in a way, um, because it has a sense of service, dedication, obviously it involves sacrifice. And I worry about that. And this is kind of a confessional moment, I mm -hmm. guess, but I wonder if I would so freely raise my hand again. Uh, I'm a product of ROTC. Um, if you say what well, among the five things that very important in terms of your life, uh, I'm very proud, nine years um, service uh, in the Army and the officer's rank. Um, but I don't know. 
and that, that disturbs me. So there is this political fallout, I guess is what I'm trying to say, that impacts the notion of serving uh, the country, and that is sad, very sad to me, mm -hmm. very sad to me. It's, it is an interesting issue, um, but I've also seen, and I think I see it some when I'm reviewing, uh, you know, one of the things I have to do as a professor of military science is review scholarship applications and actually interview scholarship candidates, and, um, and then I get to see our, you know, all the cadets who actually do come into our program, and um, despite the fact that we may hear or have feel or, or feel or see polls that indicate maybe uh, people are less proud to be Americans. I do think the spirit of service is still pretty strong in our youth. Um, and uh, I've seen some studies about um, Generation Z, or uh, yeah, I guess you would call it, but th that generation, um, whereas when you and I were in college, spring break rolled around, we were thinking about going to the beach and, and probably doing stuff we weren't supposed to. But uh, for some of our younger generation, spring break rolls around and they're doing service trips. They're going to do, you know, Habitat for Humanity builds and things like that. And, um, and I'm seeing that in some of these applications, these, these really amazing things, people doing um, uh, trips, you know, abroad, to, uh, you know, help out you know, other you know, less fortunate communities and things like that. So it's, I think there still is that sense of service. And, um, but in terms to turn, to have that translate into patriotism and a desire to serve your country, this, something we need to look at. And one other thing I just, you know, maybe is, maybe it'd be a good topic for another so sh show, but, uh, you know, I know some, to include, you know, uh, retired General McChrystal are pushing the idea of national service, yes. you know, and, and having kind of a compulsory national service. And, and maybe it's that being a way of creating that common thread among all our society where, you know, and then kind of decrease some of this uh, polarization that we're seeing across society right now as well. Absolutely, and, and, and certainly if you're in a foxhole together, as they say, you're there together. And uh, the old notion, if you come and help me paint my fence, whatever you believe, whatever you think, whatever your background, there is that kind of understanding. And national service is something that um, would not only benefit the generationally in America, but it would also make a difference in community, especially it wouldn't have to be military, but other right, services. Exactly. You're absolutely right. The polls in terms of Generation Z, not only in terms of dedication to service, but also, okay, let's get things done. Let's mm -hmm. don't talk about it. I mean, they're very action oriented. And as you say, the notion of service um, is, is very, very, very high. Um, when some of the kind of national security kind of things come into that makes this a crisis, and you use the term in terms of recruitment crisis. Mm -hmm. um, are, are there have been some concern about the lowering of standards. Is that going to have to be the case in terms of the short term? So I think that um, that isn't the intention. Um, I think in the past that has been dabbled with and, and uh, army leaders have realized that that didn't work out very well for us. Um, and so there was, as you know, I think back in June, there was a week where they had said maybe they weren't going to require a GED or high school to, to diploma to enlist, but then they quickly um, backtracked from that because they, they just realized that, that that's not the direction they wanted to go. Um, so that that's, you know, on the aptitude side at least, one of the things the Army is doing, you know, and whether it's a um, outgrowth of the, you know, maybe again, the virtual learning during COVID and, and the lower aptitude scores, um, they've, uh, they've started a pilot and I think they're, they're gonna try to grow it to for something called the Future Soldier Preparatory Course. Um, and uh, it's actually supposed to, there's, there's one branch of it that deals with the aptitude and getting um, uh, eligible soldier or potential soldiers uh, scores higher. And there's another side of it that deals with physical, the physical side of it, so, you know, um, going over the concepts of holistic health and fitness and um, trying to you know, get them to where they can meet the, uh, the height and weight screening tables. But the aptitude piece I think is pretty interesting and there's been, um, uh, there's been similar things that they've done, uh, courses that they've done with enlisted soldiers to get their GT scores up, you know, for if, if, when they wanna take a course to get their, um, uh, their scores up to get a better MOS. Uh, military occupational specialty. Um, 
it, that they've seen success with that. So they've, they've launched this pilot down at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. It's going to be a 90-day prep course, and they're hoping that uh, I think they're starting with about 2,000 or so um, uh, potential soldiers going through that. And it's it's not in a basic training environment, so they're not getting yelled at, and they're you know, and uh, it's just there to help them improve themselves to get them to the point to where they uh, that they can be um, soldiers. And so I think that's that's the direction they're going as opposed to lowering standards to, to try to um, grow the Army. From an operational standpoint, um, mm -hmm. some are saying that um, there may be more overseas rotations and deployments mm -hmm. in the short term, right. um, perhaps more dependence on the National Guard. I mean, do you see some structural kinds of uh, things like that in the short term? Right, definitely. Um, we only have 31 brigade combat teams active duty in the Army, um, and uh, you talk that, that they're they're projecting that there could be up to about a 15,000 soldier shortfall by the end of this fiscal year. 15,000 is the size of a Army division, wow. um, and you know a, a typical Army division has three brigade combat teams, um, and so how are they going to uh, how are they going to balance that shortfall across the entire Army? Of course, not everybody in the Army is in a brigade combat team. So the, it sounds like, according to our Chief Staff of the Army, General McConville, they're having at least weekly sessions where they're talking about where they can adjust the force structure to keep our fighting units strong um, so that we don't necessarily um, lose that uh, capability. But th there are going to have to be some tough decisions made. Um, and certainly the idea of maybe more frequent rotations on deployments and things like that. Now, you know, we, we just ended the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, so the demand is a little bit lower, but of course now we see we have forces that are rotating through Europe, and, and we want to have other forces available for whatever other contingency um, uh, should come. Was the vaccination mandate, was that kind of also problematic during the pandemic or uh, we're still in a pandemic but you know what I mean well I can only talk about from a little bit from my perspective um, I only we only had out of uh, 500 cadets in um, the the New River Battalion which is the, the Army ROTC battalion uh, that encompasses Virginia Tech and Radford we only ended up having three cadets who uh, requested an exception to policy um, and since, th since uh, they did that, one of them actually did get vaccinated, and uh, the other one was just waiting for the Novavax vaccine uh, to come out. And so we expect him that he's, he's going to get vaccinated, you know, because he had a religious objection that the Nova Novavax doesn't apply to the Novavax uh, vaccine. So for, for at least for, for us, it hasn't been a big issue, and I think... Um, but uh, it, it could, I mean, that, that could be a factor for, for why people are considering not joining the Army at this point, because they don't want to get vaccinated. But I feel like um, if, if Virginia Tech is any example in Radford, then it, it hasn't been a huge issue for us. Yes, and of course, you know, back in the day, again, I'm generational, I'm dating myself. I don't know what all the shots got. We yeah, walked exactly. down the hall and you, and, and, and <laughs> you just got left and right and right, and it took two days to right. be able to lift your arm and so never thought about saying well now wait a minute i'm not going to take that one i mean it it, it, it is kind of right. a different times you may find this an, an odd question um and again uh, it's reflective only in terms of my experience universities faculty and especially post vietnam era um was a tough environment and supportive in terms of the military Certainly Virginia Tech is an incredible corps of cadets um, and what have you, but are campuses hostile themselves, you think, now in terms of as they were back in the 60s, 70s, and perhaps 80s? I highly doubt that, um, and certainly my experience, my recent experience has been um, at Virginia Tech where, like you said, the corps of cadets is a pretty cherished institution. You know, they, they get the prime seating at the football games and everything, and it's, it's really awesome to be down sitting with them during, during the games. But uh, um, I, I don't see, uh, I have not personally observed that. And I've also spent some time uh, as a, um, pursuing my senior service college fellowship at Duke University. I never felt uh, there was any, you know, hostility or discrimination against me. Of course, I was in there um, uh, 
uh, grand strategy program there, the American Grand Strategy Program, and, and the public policy school there. So maybe a different demographic p potentially. And then um, when I was a cadet um, and uh, you know, at Georgetown University, you know, if anything, maybe indifference, but never hostility. So that's very yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, um, that's all the time we have. I certainly um, how important the military was as part of my life. Um, and we certainly need a strong forces, especially in these uncertain times. But I also very much uh, appreciate your service and dedication to this nation. Well, it's my pleasure, and I'm you know, super happy to be where I am and, and serve in our country. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for now. I want to thank my guest, Colonel Cogbill, and thank you for joining us, and hope you'll do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.